Thank you, Erica, for that beautiful music. Give you time to kind of sit back and relax and forget about everything that happened this past week, hopefully. Will you join me in the call to worship? We all read the all, the dark print, and I will read one. Together, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. We speak because you spoke first, bringing voice to the brightness of the sun and singing the airy darkness of the sky. You spoke this earth from end to end, and speaking must have given you pleasure, for you said it was good. May the words of our hearts and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Year after year, you have poured forth speech, passing stories and statutes down through hands and lips. From you, we learned to speak, and speaking, we spoke to you singing songs of consolation that would become your psalms to us, writing poems our children's children would hear as the voice of God. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Your law, your law O Lord, is perfect. Your word is the one that endures. We seek the grammar of your justice in the words that you spoke before. Speak here now. Speak here once more. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Good morning. We will... Frame our time of confession with "Hold Me, God." The hymnal should, or the hymn, should be stuck in the front or back of your hymnal. Little folded up piece of paper. So I invite you to find that and then turn in your hymnal to 894, which we will use this morning for our prayer. You'll note that we have. There's a point in the prayer where it calls for silence and I will hold silence for a little moment and I invite you to pause and reflect and confess and then we will sing the Kyrie Eleison portion of the Hold Me God again. We'll finish the prayer and then we'll sing Hold Me God all the way through. Do not be alarmed. It will all go very smoothly. Let us sing. O Prince of Peace, from peace that is no peace, from the grip of all that is evil, from a violent righteousness, deliver us. From paralysis of will, from lies and misnaming, from terror of truth, deliver us. From hardness of heart, from trading and slaughter, from the worship of death, deliver us.
by the folly of your gospel, by your choosing our flesh, by your nakedness and pain, heal us, by your weeping over the city, by your refusal of the sword, by, the fa by your facing of horror, heal us, by your bursting from the tomb, by your coming in judgment, by your longing for peace. Yes. Grant us peace. Amen. We hear from the prophet Isaiah, who will condemn me? It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. My God who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Friends, God draws near to us and helps us. In the name of Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Last week, we finished our communion liturgy by passing the peace, and I promised you, I believe I promised you, some different ways to pass the peace throughout Lent. I will tell you that this is like my second way, and I might run out of ways quickly, but I wanted to tell you about how I learned to pass the peace when I was in seminary um, using ASL. So some of you might know this. Um, so I'm going to teach you all how to say, peace be with you in ASL. So peace is like that. And with is like this, and you. So, peace be with you. And then the response is nice and easy. And also with you. Because it's just saying. That's, that's what that is. So let's try it together. Peace be with you. And also with you. I'll do it. You can respond with the also with you, so your line's easy. And then I invite you to share the peace with one another. Peace be with you. Yeah. <laughs> Please share God's peace with one another. <laughs> It's time for the kids to come forward. Time with Kathy. Come on, children, to the gospel feast. All are welcome at the gospel feast.
decisions. Looked like she was bargaining with the, about the stickers. <laughs> if you would like to make your first fruit offerings to Lorraine Avenue, you can place your gifts in the back uh, offering plates, the back of the sanctuary, or you can also mail in your checks or use the link on our website. Now let's listen to Erica's musical offering and maybe think about the many gifts and blessings that we have received in this past week. Please pray with me. God of life, you give these off we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves May we live with generous hearts and open hands. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Exodus 20 verses 1 through 17, and if you'd like to follow along in, our, in your pew Bible, it's on page 58. It's the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who mis misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. 
Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkeys or anything that belongs to your neighbor. New Testament reading is from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, and that's on page 863. Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seating at, seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking in the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. We'll sing number 194 and I invite you to stand as you are able. morning again. I have two things to note before we start, or before I kind of jump in this morning. One, these two texts are the lectionary for 
the third Sunday in Lent, and I have a lectionary podcast that I listen to because I'm a nerd, and I write sermons. So they go through the lectionary readings. It's from Luther Seminary, Working Preacher. And this Sunday, they were like, no, don't, don't put the Exodus reading with the John reading. Don't do it. Just don't do it. And I was like, well, I've already chosen my text, so I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> and we're going to get into a little bit of why that might be. Um, I think that their point is very good. Um, it looks a lot in this passage like Jesus is saying the temple is absolutely no more. So when you pair it with the Exodus reading, it can feel very like, oh, okay, yeah, that was the law before, but now we don't have to pay any attention to it. And that's not what, I'm, what is happening, and I don't think the people at Luther Seminary think that's what's happening. They're just saying that if you don't talk about it, it's going to feel real weird. So we're going to talk about it a little bit this morning. And I've already forgotten my second thing, and I can't think of what it is, and it must not have been that important. Oh, here's what it is. The text in John... <laughs> well, yes, we're going to talk about that too. But... Um, <laughs> The text in John, one of the interesting things that's happening in that passage is that the disciple, there's this running commentary like, oh, and the disciples, they knew later that this was happening. That text, the verbs are in future, so it, it literally says things like, the disciples will know later. So if you read it like that, it kind of gives it a different vibe. It's kind of narrator voice over the text, like, the disciples didn't know then, but they will. <laughs> so that's kind of when... That's something that's going to go through this whole morning, I think, that John is craft. The book of John is a narrative. It is trying to make a very particular point, as all the Gospels are. Um, and that's why certain things might not feel so great to our ear, because the community that they're addressing is very different than the community that we are in. So join me in prayer. God who has been the cloud of presence, God who took flesh to be among us. May we find you here in this space and then far beyond these walls. Amen. So last week, Jesus' words were to take up our cross and follow him. And we talked about how if we don't take up our cross, we risk our souls. And this week, Jesus' words call us to believe that we can find the divine outside the walls of our places of worship. Calls us to believe in and live the good news. That's what Jesus is calling us to. And we are reminded by these passages that our faith is embodied. Yet, our God is unseen. We have inherited a tradition that worshipped in the temple. We have inherited the tradition of the Israelites who worshiped God through sacrifices and contrite hearts. We have inherited a tradition that mourned for the loss of the temple and had to face the trauma of its destruction. And we have joined ourselves to Christ who both took on flesh and taught us that where we are doesn't matter as much as how we are. It is important, before we go any further, to name and acknowledge the anti-Judaism of the book of John and the anti-Semitism that anti-Judaism has encouraged. The book of John uses the term hoi ayudai, yuda, uda, ay, it's hard to say, throughout to refer to those who don't believe in Jesus. It's not just a neutral, the Jews. It is quite pointed because, by contrast, Jesus' disciples are Israelites the ones on the right path. I'm drawing from scholar Adele Reinhartz, who wrote the introductory notes for the book of John in the Jewish annotated New Testament. And she teases out a bit of the binary of John. So almost everything in John is a binary. There's light, there's dark, there's good, there's bad. Very strict right and wrong. And Reinhartz writes, quote, in the gospel's stark rhetoric of binary opposition, the Jews are associated with each negative pole, flesh rather than spirit, darkness rather than light, death rather than life, eternal damnation rather than salvation, Satan rather than God. It is the Jews. 
that plot to kill Jesus and the Jews that cry out for his execution at the end of the book. And these distinctly anti-Jewish moments have contributed to the deeply terrible and reprehensible history of anti-Semitism in Christianity all the way up and through today. So why is it here? Because we do know that there are Jewish people in John's community. So what is going on? It may be the community's reaction to the realities of their time. It's hard to know exactly the Gospel of John's audience, but scholars surmise that it was a diverse community of Jews, of Gentiles, and probably some Samaritans too, because we have Samaritans, the Samaritan woman at the well, we have that kind of direct connection. In the book of John, Jesus participates in Jewish festivals. His Jewishness is certainly not erased. He spends plenty of time in this temple that he cleanses. But there are also explanations of Jewish customs. They say, oh, and this is why they wash their hands this way. This is why they use these things. So it seems likely that there was a Gentile audience that had to have this explained to them. And it also seems likely that the Johannine, that's just the fancy word for the community, was the Johannine community was persecuted by those around them. The text refers to expulsion from the synagogue in chapter 9, chapter 12, chapter 16, and that probably didn't happen in a formal way during Jesus' time, but it did happen in the century following. So we may have some writing back into history going on. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we know that the very temple that Jesus, Jesus is in in this passage was destroyed in 70 AD. So here's this fledgling community, barred from their local synagogues because of tension with the very people that were part of their community, and they don't have a temple. New Testament scholar Tong Yong Jung puts it this way. Quote, the destruction, of the, second temp uh, the destruction of the second temple of Jerusalem was traumatic for the Johannine community. This pervasive trauma lingers, triggering them to recall a violent event that is described only in John. The Johannine community recalls Jesus making a whip of cords in order to drive the money changers out of the temple. Such recollection reeks of colonial trauma and mimicry that haunt the Johannine community as they try to address and reconcile the pain of losing the temple while believing that Jesus is the Messiah. In other words, the community is traumatized and they feel lost. Perhaps they're not entirely certain whether they can weather these storms. And so then the story of Jesus is shaped around their struggle in John, Jesus clears out the temple in the second ch chapter, rather than, as in all the other Gospels, right before his death. Because from the start, the point is that Jesus is the new temple, Jesus' body. And this is not as out there as we might think. In fact, Amy Jill Levine, Jewish New Testament scholar, writes in Entering the Passion of, Passion of Jesus that Jesus, quote, sounds somewhat like a Pharisee here, since the Pharisees were interested in extending the holiness of the temple to every household, end quote. Once again, we're seeing, as we are very often in the Gospels, an intra-Jewish discussion, Jewish people talking to Jewish people. Even before the temple was destroyed, there was a sense that faithful followers seek God daily, and in their houses, they find ways to bring that holiness home. Levine writes it this way, the message is a profound one. Can our homes be as sanctified, as filled with worship, as the local church? End quote. And Jesus is making a point that one day there will be no need for a temple at all. He makes this point kind of throughout John. And it's easy to fall into the trap because of this, that we don't have to pay attention to either the fact that they worshiped in the temple in the first place or to the Older Testament, or that we only have to pay attention to say the easy stuff like the Ten Commandments. But Jesus is continuing to point to an embodied faith, 
a faith that has been described and portrayed throughout the biblical story. We inherited the tradition recorded in the book of Exodus, the tradition of two tablets, the first tablet that concerns how we love God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, and the one that concerns how we love our neighbors as ourselves. We have this push and pull, not push and pull, <laughs> of the intangible God and our tangible neighbor. There's a hymn, How Can I Say I Love the Lord If I Do Not Love the One Beside Me? If I Don't Love My Neighbor? Yes. And that's that push and pull. Of the law that God commanded always be on our hearts, and even tied to one's forehead, posted on one's stores, in Deuteronomy, we have this push and pull. A God who never wanted a temple, but did call for animal sacrifices. A God who calls for a contrite heart, but also became incarnate to dwell among us. Of the intangible word that John speaks of in chapter 1. And of the fully God and fully human, Jesus. We have inherited a tradition from the traumatized Johannine community. The story is adjusted for their needs. Jesus is seen braiding the whip to drive out the buyers and sellers. But this is a, a, a necessary and not terrible thing exactly because the community has been cast out and the temple has been destroyed. It may feel harsh for them, but they're kind of, they're portraying, putting their own experience onto what they saw Jesus do. The story is expressed this way so that they can understand and begin to heal. This story is not a declaration that Jesus replaced the temple. For we know that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He says that in Matthew, but I think it applies. This is all a part of the push and pull that we see in our beautiful and sometimes messy inherited tradition. That's the thing about inheriting traditions. They're not always as clean as we would like them to be. Maybe if we came up, we wrote down all the things, they would work just the way we want them to. But when we inherit them from someone else, they're not always exactly what we want, but we can do it. We must follow the paths set before us by the commandments by the biblical story, by God. And we must do it, do this embodied thing, with our hearts, this intangible thing, turn toward God. We must let the path impact us. As Amy Jill Levine puts it, is the church just a building? Or is the church a community who gathers in Jesus' name, who acts as Jesus taught, who lives the good news. Do you live the good news? No matter where you are, in the grocery store, while making dinner, while running errands, at school, in meetings, while sending emails, do you live the good news? The news of a God who loved the Israelites enough to bring them out of slavery and make a covenant with them. The news of a God who loved the world enough to become flesh and dwell among us. The news of a God who calls us to love of God and neighbor. The news of a God who lived, died, and rose again to bring salvation to the world that the divine created. Do you live this good news? If we are not willing to take up our cross, I said last week, we risk our souls. If we are not willing to believe and live into this good news outside of our church buildings, if we're not willing to go beyond these walls, we have missed the point. We have not allowed zeal for God's house to consume us. The temple, our church building, is not the only place where we can worship God. But our physical presence in this world is an essential part of living out our faith. Our incarnate Savior journeys with us, seeking to live out this good news. May we do so.
Amen. We will sing number 802. And we will sing it as written. We will sing it as written, and then on the second page of it, here, we're going to only repeat it once. But we will repeat it. Um, and be aware that the introduction is very short. I will try to get us started, and I invite you to stand as you are able. We are at a time in our service in which we share the work of the church as well as share our prayer and joy and concern. So uh, first, though, I would like to ask, are there any guests? For 377, New Earth, Heaven's New.
So my friends, may you go and go with God, for you cannot go where God is not. Remember that God is far beyond these walls of our church building, but calls us to an embodied faith. Live in that tension between the tangible and intangible. Honor that purpose, and God will honor your dedication. My friends, may you go in peace, for it is the gift of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.